Father, your goodness is so great we can't describe it. We, we know some, some about you, but we don't know everything about you. We, we just, we're mere creatures. But Lord, we, we can know that because we are creatures, and we are creatures, we are people, mankind, male and female, young and old. You've created man to be the only creatures made in your image and likeness. We know that the sin of man has corrupted that likeness, no, but we also know that in the redeemed, you're restoring that image and likeness, and we know that there will be a day when the image and likeness will be fully restored. But even on that day, Lord, we still know that we will not know everything about you, but we will be able to be in your presence, and we will be able to see your face in its fullness and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we, we enter a new season today, don't we? <laughs> you can tell that things are disrupted already because the butterbaws are not sitting over there. <laughs> okay, this morning I'm going to be continuing our series going through the Statement of Faith concerning what we believe on certain doctrinal matters here at Grace Community Church. If you go to our church website, gccsatx.com, there's an About Us link that you can click on and read the statement in its entirety. Today's topic, what we believe about the one true God. Like last time, I'll be summarizing our statement of faith by using what it has to say, quoting our statement of faith, and I'm also going to be combining some elements of our statement of faith in the five points I'm going to make today about our statement of faith. This, again, is a topical message, as all of these will be, and it is not a comprehensive study about who God is and what God is like and all of God's attributes. It is just covering what our statement of faith, at this, at this point in our statement of faith, says about who God is and what God is like. There will be other messages on other elements and other attributes of God. But so this one will not be comprehensive today, just so you know. All right, my first point may seem rather basic and rather elementary. Our statement of faith says that there is one and only one true and living God. You might say, well, Jeff, everybody knows that. And you might say, yeah, I know people outside this building might not believe that, but there's nobody in this building who doesn't believe that. One thing I've learned in all the, all the miles I have on the odometer of my Christian life is I don't assume anything anymore. I can't assume that anybody knows anything about anything. It's like the gospel. Why do we keep saying what the gospel is over and over? Because you cannot assume that everybody understands or knows what the gospel is. So therefore, you repeat it, you repeat it, you repeat it so that people know. And it's, it's just like that here. Because I'm going to proclaim who God is today. I'm not going to give my opinion of who God is. I'm going to proclaim who He is from the Scriptures. And the God that I'm going to proclaim today is a God that the world hates. And the God I'm going to proclaim today is a God that much of what professes to be Christianity hates as well. It's not my burden today to discuss God as a trinity. That'll be in the next message coming up in a couple weeks, Lord willing. This message today is just about the one eternal supreme being known as God. One God. But not just that. A lot of people believe in one God. But they don't believe in the one true living God. Any person who believes in one God is known as a monotheist. That's a compound word made up of mono and theos. Mono means one. Theos means God. A monotheist believes that there is one God. Just because a person is a monotheist does not make them a Christian. And just because a person is a monotheist does not mean that they believe in the one true living God of Scripture. Muslims are monotheists. They believe that there is one God. But Allah is a false God. And Allah is not the God of the Scriptures. 
And the Quran goes to great lengths to tell everybody that Allah is not the God of the Scriptures. And anybody who says Allah is just another name for the one true living God doesn't know who God is and they don't know who Allah is either. Jehovah's Witnesses are monotheists, but they deny who the one true living God is. And I'll go so far as to say that Roman Catholics deny who the one true living God is. Why do I say that? They believe that God has given up what he says about himself as the role of the one Redeemer, the one Savior, and that God has given up that role to a creature known as Mary. that he has a co-redemptrix, a partner in redemption, a co-mediatrix, a second mediator. That, brethren, is blasphemy. That's a denial of who God is. You think I'm kidding? Go online. You can read Pope John Paul II's last will and testament. I've talked about this before. You can go online and read his last will and testament. You can read the motto of his life. The motto of his life is totus tuus from the Latin. Totus tuus means totally yours. Now, can a Christian say totally yours? Yes, but only if you say it about Jesus Christ. Pope John Paul says that about Mary. His last will and testament says he places his eternal fate into the hands of Mary, a creature, a sinner, not a sinless redeemer or a sinless mediator. He places his hands into the into the, he places his eternal fate into the hands of a sinful creature, not a sinless creator, not a sinless redeemer, not a sinless mediator, and that's a denial of who the one true living God is. And we're going to cover that maybe in a little bit more detail in the next message, Lord willing. Hear what Jeremiah 10:10 10, 10 says. Jeremiah 10:10 10, 10 says this. It says, "But the Lord is the true God." You'll notice all of these statements have a definite article there. The, not a. It's not nebulous. It's very specific. The means specific. It's singular. He is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Jeremiah 10.10 says, But the Lord, in your ESVs, that is small caps and large caps. That's translating Yahweh, the covenant name for God. One God. Yes, I'm saying it again. One God. There is not a buffet line of true gods out there. There is one God, the living God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the living God. God is alive. He's not a dead God, small g, like other people serve. He's not a block of wood which has no life in him. God has life in himself. He's always had life in Himself. He did not derive life from anything or anyone. He has life in Himself by His very nature. He has always existed. He's everlasting backwards through time and eternity, and He's going to be everlasting forwards through all time and eternity. He has always been and He always will be. There is no beginning to God and there is no end to God. You, you know it. You, you know it. Just think before the creation of the world. What was there? God. Nothing but God. No time, no space, no heavens, no earth, no firmament, none of that stuff that we see in Genesis chapter 1. Just God. He has always been. He has always had life. He is always who He is now. He has always been who He is now. And He always will be who He is now. Isaiah wrote this when he spoke about, when he wrote about the Lord speaking about Himself. The Lord saying this about Himself in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Once again, just because a person believes that there is a God, or that there is only one God, does not mean they believe in the one true God. You know, as well as I do, that, that Satan and the demons are monotheists. And not only are they monotheists, they know who the one true God is. <laughs> but they're all damned. They're all damned. Just because you know who God is does not mean that you are redeemed. All, all the false gods that are out there, I already talked about some of them, 
Men want to mold God into a small g God of their own creation because they don't like what the Bible has to say. What God has revealed about Himself to us about who He is and what He is like. They don't, well, God can't be like that. So therefore, I'm going to deny what the Scripture says about that. That's what people do because they want to mold a God into a God of their own making. They want to be the Creator and make God the creature. You can't do that. The creature does not get to tell the Creator what He is like. We are bound to worship and adore and love God as He has revealed Himself to us. You may see some things about God that are hard to swallow, but you still have to swallow them. Because it's Him talking about Himself. Okay, point number two. This one true and living God is worthy to be feared and admired by all, and this God is inexpressible, glorious in His holiness. God is worthy. I'm going to say that more than once. He is worthy. He does not have to prove Himself to any of His creatures. He does not have to meet man-made standards which pagans want to put in place to determine whether or not this God is really God. God is not the one on trial here. Man is on trial because of sin. You don't get to put man, you don't get to put God in the witness stand and act as the prosecutor challenging God about what he says about himself. We are the people who need to accept what he says about himself and worship him and love him and adore him because of what he has said about himself. God is worthy. He was worthy whether somebody believes he's worthy or not. He's worthy. He was worthy before any of us were a twinkle in our mother's eye. He was worthy. He is worthy. He'll still be worthy when our bodies are in the grave as as we wait for Jesus to return. He's worthy no matter how many men want to spit in His face. How How many of those men spit in His face? They spit in the face of the very God who's given them their life, their breath, their being, and God has given them the saliva which they spit back at Him. He's worthy. He's worthy of admiration. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of worship. And He's worthy of fear. The psalmist writes the Lord's words, and the Lord's words are somewhat sarcastic in this particular psalm, when the Lord says to His enemies, the Lord says to His enemies, you thought I was one just like you. No, God is not like His enemies. He is not like those creatures who hate Him. Psalm 33 says this, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. About five years ago, when the pulpit was over there, I spoke for a couple minutes on how we've cheapened the usage of the word awesome. Everything is awesome now. Oh man, that, 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 that fajita was awesome. No. Okay. <laughs> no, there's only one who is awesome, and that is God. He is a God worthy of being looked at with awe, A-W-E. He is worthy of being revered, yes, but He's also worthy of being feared, and fear and reverence are not synonymous. Men don't want a God that they must fear. Men don't want a holy God. They want a really nice God. I remember listening to a Paul Washer sermon back in Michigan. And and in that sermon, I I know I'm going to mess up the quote. Washer said something like this. He said, he said, everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. Well, he's right. He's right in the one sense. They don't want the God of this Bible to be there. They want a God that they have created to be there. They want some form of celestial Santa Claus to be there. They don't want the one true living God to be there. If you have your Bibles, please open them up to Psalm 96. I'll be reading verses 2 through 9.
verses 2 through 9. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. I don't want to read it off my, my text. I want to read it from the book here. Hold on. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Tremble. Tremble. Think about singing, Were You There? Tremble. A God worthy of of trembling before a God greatly to be feared you look up the meaning of that word in verse 4 he is to be feared feared above all gods it is not merely a reverence as we keep hearing are we to revere God yes we are to revere God but it goes beyond reverence because you can revere men We know in San Antonio, certain people are greatly revered. I had it happen at work. I saw Tim Duncan at HEB. It's like they've seen God Himself. He's a man. He's just a man. People revere men. People act, you know, you come into the the presence of somebody famous. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to say people do it with certain, they do it with, they would do it with Paul Washer. Be honest. But we're not to treat Paul Washer like we treat God. We may greatly respect Paul Washer, but we fear God. That word fear in Hebrew, guess what it says when you look up all the lexicons? every one of them will say something along the lines of inspiring terror, dreadful, to terrify, to cause terror or trembling. They say that in the Hebrew and they say that in the Greek. Scripture tells us if you do not fear God, you are neither wise nor knowledgeable because the Proverbs tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of both wisdom and knowledge. Proverbs 1, Proverbs 9. If you do not fear the Lord, Jeremiah 32.40 says, you are not born again. Because the fear of the Lord is a gift given to those who are participants, beneficiaries in the new covenant. Somebody's going to say about the fear of the Lord, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. And I'm going to say, amen, amen, it is the God of the Old Testament, but it's also the God of the New Testament. Because God cannot change. Our attitude toward God is still supposed to be the same attitude that God commanded men to have toward Himself in the Old Testament as well. Just because we're New Covenant, New Testament believers doesn't mean we get to go, ah, no, God's not like that. We don't have to do that anymore. I'm not going to spend time on it. Read Matthew 10. Read Luke 12. See what Jesus says about the command to fear the Lord. But you, you look at what the Scripture says. You read what the Lord told Israel. Isaiah chapter 8. The Assyrians are coming. (laughs) And the Assyrians are coming was not good news. What does the Lord tell Isaiah to do in Isaiah chapter 8? He tells Isaiah not to fear what the people fear. What were the people going to be fearing? They were going to be fearing the Assyrians because they knew the power of the Assyrians. Isaiah 8, verses 12 and 13. This is what the Lord tells the prophet Isaiah. He says, Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. D-R-E-A-D, dread. But the Lord of hosts, Him you shall honor as holy. Let Him be your fear and let Him be your dread. It's not very popular in Christian circles to talk about the Lord being worthy of fear, much less being worthy of dread 
like Isaiah is told to do there. But He is. There's that whoa factor about God when you look at who He is and what He does and how He acts in the Scripture. You go, whoa. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lie to an apostle. Acts chapter 5. Go ahead. Lie to an apostle. Boom. Get stricken dead. Go ahead. Get innovative in your worship. You see fire come down from heaven and smoke a couple young priests. The sons of Aaron. Boom. Go ahead. Go ahead. Try this God. See how that works out. It hasn't worked out so well for some people in the history of Scripture. R.C. Sproul has a great story about how people have just become so accustomed to the mercy and grace of God that when God puts His holiness on display, people get angry. How can God do that? How can God kill Uzzah? Because all Uzzah was trying to do was trying to protect the honor of the Lord by grabbing the ark as it's sliding down to the ground. Well, God can do that because Uzzah violated the holiness of God. God had told the people, don't touch it. Uzzah touched it. But Uzzah was just trying to do something good. God said, don't touch. And you know what? When God showed His holiness there, David was angry. God didn't do anything unjust there. God showed justice there. Just because God did not show mercy does not mean God did anything unjust. God exercised justice on Uzzah there. God exercised and displayed His holiness. You read what the Lord said to Israel in Deuteronomy 28. First 14 verses, He's laying out covenant blessings. Guess what? There are 68 verses in Deuteronomy 28. Verses 15 through 68 are about covenant curses if Israel disobeys. And one of those curses, this is where you go, whoa, about who God is. Deuteronomy 28.53 says, He's going to cause them if they rebel. He's going to cause them to eat the fruit of their womb, the flesh of their sons and daughters, if they rebel. We know going forward, what does Israel ultimately end up thinking? Well, God's not going to do that. We're His people. God's obligated to be merciful. He has to be merciful to us. We're Israel. <laughs> Don't go there. Go ahead. Read Jeremiah. Read Lamentations written by Jeremiah. Twice in Lamentations, Jeremiah says, Deuteronomy 28.53 happened. The people of Jerusalem, as the Babylonians were coming, they did engage in cannibalism because things got so bad. And you know what Jeremiah says about that? He doesn't say, those, those nasty Babylonians. No, Jeremiah keeps saying, Lord, You did this to us. And You did it to us, Lord, because of our sin. We deserved what happened there. That is a God that you look at and go, you don't mess. <laughs> You do not mess with this God. This God, the Lord God Almighty, is the one true God and He keeps His promises. Deuteronomy 28.53 was a promise of judgment. A promise of a curse. And God keeps His promises not just with regard to salvation, but God keeps His promises with regard to cursing and judgment as well. You read those, you read those discussions of the torment of the wicked in Revelation. And you go, you back up a little bit because of who this God is. Because this God is holy. Not merely holy, but holy, 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 right? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Majestic in holiness is what Exodus 15.11 says about Him. How is He holy, holy, holy? Well, there, you can probably break it down into two ways that He is holy, holy, holy. First off, He's distinct. He's separate. Set apart. Remember what He told His enemies. You thought I was one just like you. He is different from us. He's one of a kind. There's no, no other being like Him. There's no God like Him because there is no other God. Secondly, He's morally and ethically pure and perfect. He's sinless. 
There's a reason that men of God did what they did when they had a vision of the Lord and His holiness. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, Isaiah says, I am undone. He's disintegrated. He falls apart with his vision of the Lord seated on the throne high and exalted in Isaiah chapter 6. Ezekiel falls on his face. We see the Apostle John falling on his face as if dead in Revelation when he gets that vision. And we better not think that we know what perfection is because none of us have seen it, none of us have experienced it, and, and we will not in this life. But we will one day. But right now, we can't. On that day, that great and final day, when we are changed so much, when our souls are reunited with our, with our resurrected bodies, we will be able not only to see perfection, but we're going to live in the midst of perfection. When we see the face of God, Revelation 22.4, we're going to be living in that full manifest presence forever. But now, now if we experience that holiness, we'd be stricken dead. All right, point number three. This one true and living God is absolutely sovereign in the affairs of heaven and earth, being independent and supreme in all things according to the counsel of His own will, and this includes absolute sovereignty over the salvation of men. Sovereign. If someone is sovereign, they have control, they have power, they have authority. Now, we know we have examples of sovereignty in our times, in our culture, we know politicians have some level of sovereignty, not nearly as much sovereignty as they think they do. <laughs> but they have authority. Kings have authority. Well, go back to what I said earlier about a king. There's one true king. And this one true king is the one true living God. And he has absolute sovereignty over his creation. Everything in creation. Not just whether or not it rains in San Antonio once in the next six months. He does have control over that. But He has control over everything. Everything and everybody. Psalm 135.6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. The wisdom of Proverbs 19.21 tells us that many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Psalm 115.3 tells us our God is in the heavens. He does as He pleases. Where was God when the tsunami came? He was on His throne. Sending the tsunami, that's where He was. Where was He on 9.11? On His throne, ordaining all the actions of that day. I could never worship a God like that, people say. You know what? And they're exactly right. Because they don't have a category for a God like that. But if they don't worship that God, they're not worshiping the one true living God who has revealed Himself in this book. The one whom Isaiah quoted, saying this about himself in Isaiah chapter 45. The ESV says, I form light and I create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Did you hear what I said? I make well-being and create calamity. Do you think all the stuff going on in our society is going on outside the sovereign control of our God? I'll tell you what, <laughs> you go back and, and ask Frank to borrow his Bible and see what it says about Isaiah 45.7. You know how Isaiah 45.7 reads in the King James? It doesn't say, I create calamity. Or it said, I make well-being. It says, I make peace and I create evil. Jeff, that's not what it means. Okay. <laughs> you want to have that study? <laughs> yes, it is what it means. Whoa. I create calamity? Yes, it is what it means. And that's one reason we ought to tremble. Tremble before this God. Because He is still holy and pure and sinless and perfect. And He does what He says in Isaiah 45.7. And He does it without sinning. That's what He said about Himself. It is our responsibility as creatures to love Him for that. Because that's who He is. We don't get to tell God, well, you can't be like that God because it doesn't make sense to me or I don't like that. I could worship a God. Well, 
Yeah, a lot of people can't worship that God. And that's not going to turn out well for those people. That word in Isaiah 45, 7, Ra in the Hebrew, calamity, does it mean calamity? Yes, you know what? It also means evil. Same word that Job used when Job said, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive Ra, evil? And go back to Job 42.11. We see the same thing said in Job 42.11. Now, don't, <laughs> I don't, don't sit there and think that this old man's gone off the deep end. All I'm doing is quoting what God has revealed about Himself. And our unchanging God is still that God today. I talked about Jeremiah sitting there in the rubble of Jerusalem. Now, a few sentences after in chapter 3, when he says what we have brought into our contemporary worship as the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. He says that in chapter 3. A few sentences after that in Lamentations chapter 3, he says this. He says, Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? That's a rhetorical question. What is the assumed answer? Yes, it is. Everything that happens in all of creation, the Lord is controlling it. It's not merely that the Lord permits certain things. It's not as if events in time and space sneak up on Him and He's got to go, whoa, wait a minute, let me consider this, see whether or not I want this to happen. No, everything happens because it's always been in His plan and in His sovereign control. He is active in governing His creation. And if there is some meteor out there flying around in the celestial bodies that 37 years from now is going to be big enough to land in that cemetery over there and blow up San Antonio, you know what? He not only knows it's going to happen, He's controlling that meteor, and it's going to hit that cemetery and blow up San Antonio because He's God. And He controls His creation and He doesn't ask for our input as He controls His creation. And His control of His creation not only applies to what we see in nature, it applies to the acts of men, it also applies to the salvation of men. Every single person that the Lord God sent His Son Jesus to save is going to be saved. Every one of them. Yes, that's the doctrine of election. And praise God for election because without election, everybody's damned. We'd all be damned due to Adam's sin and our own sin. You get Genesis 3 wrong, you're going to get everything wrong. You get Genesis 3 right, you see that God must choose people in order for anybody to be saved. Praise God that He foreknew, loved in advance a people and predestined them to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those whom He predestined, what does that tell us in Romans 8? Those whom He predestined, He called. Those whom He called, He justified. And those whom He justified, He glorified. He, he glorified, that's the end of the chain. You read that, Romans 8, 29 and 30, and it's the same group of people all the way through that chain. There's nobody who comes in after the fact or nobody's removed from that during the whole process. The people who are at the beginning of that chain are the same people at the end of that chain. Praise God for that chain. All those five verbs are past tense, you'll notice. Foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. That's called a prophetic perfect because were we yet justified when Paul wrote that? No. No. But the sense of this, it's a done deal. It's accomplished in the mind of God. It's just waiting to happen in time and space. We sit here 2,000 years later being beneficiaries of what Paul wrote there in Romans 8, 29 and 30. And God doesn't respect anybody with regard to His sovereign choice. He doesn't look at a group of people and say, oh, well, I am bound to choose the poor for salvation. Now, does He choose the poor for salvation? Yes but He doesn't choose all of them. You know what? God can even choose the rich. And He does. It doesn't matter who you are, what you're like. God in His free sovereign choice is the one who determines that. And yes, we'll get to Romans 9 in a few minutes. God isn't under any obligation which any man can impose upon Him to save anybody. In grace. Think about what He did in grace. What did He do? He's chosen to save a number of the descendants of Abraham as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. 
And people still say that God is unfair. The issue is not that God is unfair because He hasn't chosen every single person without exception to be saved. That is a man-centered view of who God is and how God acts. The God-centered view is, thank the Lord He chose one. Thank the Lord that He didn't smite the human race in Genesis 3. What He did by not smiting the human race in Genesis 3 is far beyond what justice demanded. Justice demanded, kill them all. We're done. But I heard a comment. Mercy came into Genesis 3. In mercy, God did not kill the human race. In mercy, He provided a plan for redemption that He did not provide for Satan and the demons. You're going to say that God is unjust because He has chosen to save a people as numerous as the sand on the sea and the stars in the sky? Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? I'll go back there in a minute. Point number four. Point number four is God alone knows all things before they occur because they all occur exactly as He has purposed. And for all of this, God is neither the author of sin nor can guilt or blame be attributed to Him for the evil intentions and actions of any of His creatures. Now, a couple minutes ago, I said it's, it's... I hope I said it. It's not just that God knows all things that are going to happen. Well, He does know all things that are going to happen because He ordains all things which are going to happen. He knows what's going to happen because He's causing all things to happen. And He's always known what He's going to cause to happen. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, the Lord tells us that not only is He God and that there is no other like Him, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, but that He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, and that His counsel will stand, and that His purpose will be accomplished. From ancient times things not yet done. Things in San Antonio, Texas on July 12, 2020. July 13, 2020. In every single day until the Son of God, Jesus Christ, returns, and beyond that into all eternity. It's not nothing is going to catch God by surprise. But what does this mean when we talk about His knowing his, his, based on His decreeing and His ordaining all, all events in human history? All events in human history. The question gets asked, does that make God the author of evil? It's interesting what happens when, when you get asked that question. Then you ask the questioner, okay, tell me what you mean by the author of evil. Quite often, they, they can't tell you what the author of evil is. Why do they ask the question? Because they've heard other people ask the question. Well, what, what, what is the issue? The issue here is, is, what they're trying to get at is, doesn't that make God wicked? Doesn't that make God the one who is, who is evil here? God doing evil. Well, is God the first cause of everything? Yes. Does that make God the author of evil? Well, there, there are a whole bunch of sermons on that. <laughs> I, I could give a 90-second answer. I can give a two-second answer. Well, the two-second answer is no, He's not. Okay. Now, just for merely, me to merely assert that, though, doesn't really say anything. But let me ask you this. Can God do evil? No. His nature does not permit Him to do evil. That's when people ask that question. Well, God can do anything, right? No, God can't do that which is against His nature. God cannot lie. God cannot change. God cannot swear by a name greater than Himself. God can only do that which His nature demands that He do. His nature is such that He is sinless. It is not merely that God chooses to not sin. The issue is, is that God cannot sin. Everything God does is without sin. Even decreeing evil and wicked acts. The objection comes, well, that can't be. The response is, the Bible says it is. You don't get to put God <laughs> in the, in the, on the stand. That's who God is. God does everything He does without sin. Even His control and His decreeing 
of wicked acts. You, you can just look at Peter's sermon at Pentecost. How does Peter evangelize his Jewish brethren? You got all these people there for Pentecost. And what does he say? Peter stands up and he says, you know, God loves you, Jesus died for you, and God has a wonderful plan for your life, right? No, he didn't say anything of the sort. What does he tell them? <laughs> he tells them, you know what? You guys killed Jesus Christ. You lawless men. And this was done by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Peter's not shy about proclaiming in evangelism the absolute sovereignty of God over everything. Peter's not worried here about, well, I might offend these people. I might touch something that causes them to be a little off. Peter stands there and he tells them the absolute truth. Okay, let me ask you this. Did God do anything evil in His definite plan and foreknowledge of the crucifixion of His Son? Well, the answer is no, because God can't do anything evil. Okay, who, who killed the Messiah? Did men kill the Messiah? Yeah. Were the Jews responsible for the crucifixion of the Messiah? Yeah. Were the Romans responsible for the crucifixion of the Messiah? Yeah. Was God responsible for the crucifixion of the Messiah? Yeah, Isaiah 53, smitten by God. Who sinned there? Men, Jewish and Roman. Did God sin? God can't sin. That's trying to apply biblical reasoning and biblical thinking. Men say, well, that makes God the author of evil. God cannot do what is evil, even as He decrees what is evil. You tell me what law God violated there. He didn't violate any law. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder is given to men. God is the giver of life, and God can take life if He wants to. He's God. Nobody gets to arrest God and have Him hauled downtown because you don't like what He says about Himself here. And that leads me to my fifth and last point. Men often put themselves in the place of finding fault with God for His designs, but it is in no way wise or advantageous for men to argue with God or find fault with Him. Job chapter 40, verse 2. What does the Lord say to Job after He's just let Job have it for two chapters? Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Job responds. It's quite a different tone <laughs> than what we've seen <laughs> starting in chapter 4 going through chapter 37. Job now says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. You think about what happened there. The Lord had already told Job as he's getting ready to speak in Job 38, dress for action like a man. Gird up your loins. Get ready because it's a coming. And he's going to say the same thing again in chapter 40. Dress for action like a man. Gird up your loins. Get ready. Because it was coming and it came. The Word of the Lord came to Job and to us there from the one true living God who says, you be careful about questioning how I operate my creation. The one true living God, Isaiah 45, verse 9. You'll notice I've quoted from Isaiah 45 several times here. Isaiah 45, 9. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. In Romans 9, Paul calls upon that statement in Isaiah 45. And as we approach the end of the message here, I want you to turn to Romans 9. In Isaiah 45, we have imagery being used of a pot and a potter. The clay and the one who forms the clay. I know Romans 9 is overly familiar to some people in this room, but again, I can't assume that it is overly familiar to everybody in this room. Almost 25 years ago, 
My friend Joe, some of you met Joe when he was here. He came to Grace Group here a few months ago. He quoted from Romans 9 in reading something to me, and I could not believe that those words were in my Bible. I couldn't believe they were in his Bible. The church culture that we had been in for 15 years, you just didn't go near passages like that. Now, I cannot blame the church for that. It's my responsibility to know all of my Bible. But to me, what that tells me is there may be a possibility that there are people in here who've never gone near this either, like I hadn't 25 years ago. And maybe you've never heard these words before, but I'm going to read them because they're in our Bibles. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 apply. It is all useful to us. Even Romans, even Romans 9, and it is in our statement of faith to support the statement I had just made. So Romans 9, and I'm going to start at verse 14. The setup for this, Romans 9 is not about predestination. Romans 9 is about the Word of God being on trial. You go back to the beginning of the chapter. Paul knows that people are going to question him because what about the promises made to Israel? So he's defending the Word of God and he's going to use the Word of God to defend the Word of God and he's going to use it in a manner that does explain to us the doctrines of predestination and reprobation. Okay? All right, Romans 9, verse 14. He's already just said about God's purpose of election continuing a few verses before. Right before that, we have him quoting the Old Testament where it talks about the love of Malachi and the hate of Esau. Verse 14. Using his favorite technique, rhetorical questions. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make, to make out of the same lump? One vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of His glory for vessels of mercy which He has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom He has called not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. My friend Joe read to me verse 18. Now, he didn't read it out of the ESV. One reason he didn't read it out of the ESV because the ESV wasn't published for several years after this. But he read verse 18 to me. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. I said, where'd you get that idea? He said, it's in my Bible. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. Let me show you. He flips his Bible around and shows me and I couldn't believe those words were on that page. Because I didn't have a category in my doctrine of God for a God like that. If you don't have one, <laughs> need to create one. <laughs> because God has said this about himself. My friend reading a verse to me which I had never heard in 15 years of Christianity blew me away. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. The church culture we had been in for 15 years never went near anything like this in any of its teachings. Because they didn't like it. They didn't like that part of God. But... This is God's own words breathed out to us. We don't get, <laughs> we don't get to, we don't, nah, I don't like that. You can't do that. I, I'm thinking, okay, is this, is this a one-off? What, what is going on here, Romans 9.18? God's not like that. Well, but what that did is that actually had me start studying my Bible. <laughs> Oddly enough, guess what happens when you start studying all of your Bible? you see that this is not the only place such things are mentioned. And I'm studying, and I'm studying, and I'm, I'm coming to these conclusions, and I'm sitting out there in our church culture, and there's nobody who believes this stuff. 
And I'm thinking I'm crazy. <laughs> Am I the only guy who believes this stuff? Well, I, I go online, and this is in the infant days of the internet, <laughs> back when you had ni these nice text web pages, and that's all you. Well, yeah, you know what? There are people out there who believe this kind of stuff. And Romans 9:18, and my study of it, shed light on the entirety of Scripture of who God is. I found a new God because of this. I found the God of the entirety of the Bible because of my friend reading me Romans 9.18. You read Romans 9.18 and, and people, people, don't, people just don't like this. And, and when you say certain things about who God is and what He does and you respond to their objections by saying, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? They don't like that either. You use the imagery of the clay and the potter here. People say, People say, well, you, you know what? I, I, heard this, I heard this about 20 years ago. Doug Wilson responds to the objection. People say, with regard to this, well, you know what? Man's not mere clay. And Doug Wilson says, I agree with you. Man is not mere clay, but I'll tell you what, God is no mere potter either. And he's not just a mere potter. And, and I'm going to close with a Romans 9.20 story. It's the Sunday school hour in Michigan. I don't know, eight, nine years ago. I'm going through the doctrines of the Christian faith. And I have to read Romans 9 to make one point in a particular doctrine. And I read Romans 9, I get to verse 20. Okay, I'm, and, and I'm going to read it. And, and I've told you before about my almost 90-year-old friend who sat over there, third row, on the aisle seat right near the window, and the things he would say sometimes. So I'd read Romans 9, and I get through Romans 9, and I pause after verse 20 as I'm going through the passage, but after I pause after verse 20, he blurts out something. Now, if nothing else, my friend Bill was honest. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what he said, and you may laugh, you might grimace, <laughs> or you may have some other reaction. But I get, I'm reading, and I go, but who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? I take my breath. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? That's a cop-out! <laughs> what do you mean, that's a cop-out? Well, that's, well, what are you saying? Is, that's not a satisfactory explanation for me. I think this is all unfair. That's what he was talking about. God can't do this. God can't be like that. And how can you respond to this by saying, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? <laughs> Like I said, at least my friend was honest. He did not like what Romans 9.20 had to say, much less about what it said before that. But you know what? This is the word of the living God. <laughs> this is the word of the living God, and the word of the living God and what he says about himself in his word, this is not like the buffet line back there at the fellowship meal where you get to walk by and pick the corn tortillas and skip the flour tortillas. You got to take both of them. You don't get to choose. We are bound to believe all that God has said about Himself in His Word. And yes, I did not cover much about God today. I did not talk about God, really talk about God's mercy, His grace, His love, His, His kindness, His gentleness, His compassion, His faithfulness. That's later. I'm just talking about what the second element of our statement of faith says about God today. So that other stuff will come in a future message. But this God of whom I have spoken today, how many times have I said He is worthy? I need to say it one more time. He is worthy because He is worthy. Are His ways inscrutable? Is His wisdom deep and unsearchable? Yes. And you know what? Paul praised God for that in Romans 11. Because he can't figure out this God completely and Paul praises God for it because it's who God is and we ought to praise him for who he is as well even as we don't understand him but even as we fear him and as we fear him and love him with all our heart soul mind and strength don't drive a wedge between those two we're commanded to do both we fear God we love God we praise him for who he is Let's pray. Oh Lord, yes. What are the depths? What are the depths of your wisdom? 
the riches of God. We know your ways are unsearchable. No, there's been no one who's been your counselor. No, there's no one who's been your advisor. You alone and you alone are God. Lord, we, we just bow. Maybe our bodies don't bow, but we bow our souls before you and praise you, Lord, for who you are. And we do this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.